Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Chapter 5 of Lamentations is somewhat different than the other chapters because the rest of the chapters are what we call acrostics. They start with a certain, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and they deal with every letter in subsequent paragraphs. But chapter 5 is not an acrostic poem. It is a prayer. And so the intimacy of the prayer is such that it just does not fit following a certain alphabetical order. The person who has experienced the unbelievable heartache of watching his physical world fall apart and his spiritual world fall apart and of trying to express that in words that other human beings who have not experienced that can catch something of the horror and the trauma now comes to pray that God would do something about it. It begins, remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our reproach. The remember is a common theme of the Old Testament writers. It's their way of saying, God, remember the covenant. Remember the promises. Now, even though the covenant is broken and the promises have have been totally broken on the side of Israel, the people still realize the faithfulness of God and they appeal to him in saying, remember the, way I, the reason I think it's a covenant response, the word O Lord is there. If you notice, it's in all capital letters. The R is a capital R, which means it's the covenant name for God, Y-H-W-H, that comes from Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, from the Hebrew word to be. If I had to translate that word, I would translate it the ever-living God or the only living God. And there are many places in the New Testament where that is exactly what he's called. Now, when it mentions our inheritance in verse 2, remember the land that had just been taken by the Babylonians is nothing less than the land that God promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and subsequently promised to Isaac, Jacob, and right on down the line. So what was happening, that which God had promised, God had taken away, but the Jews still considered it their inheritance. And they're reminding of those covenant promises he made. When he says it's turned over to strangers, our houses to aliens, we must remember the connotation in this part of the Near East that when victory occurred and total shift of ownership of property and all of that happened, The God of the victorious warriors was considered to be a stronger God than the God of the vanquished people. God went through a humiliating experience to get his people back from idolatry, back from that eclectic faith where they try to join Baal and Yahweh together. God paid a very high price himself. Notice where it says, We have become orphans without a father, mothers, our, our mothers are like widows. Now, I think, there's, I think that's just the truth about the many of the men are dead because they were soldiers and they died on the wall or died when the army invaded. But I also think it's another allusion to the covenant. Why, what would I see in, ver, in verse 3 that might make me think of the covenant? What's there that might jump out at you? What is one of the titles for God? Husband. Remember, God is a husband to Israel, and they're saying we're orphans, we're widows. Well, what they're implying is God has left them, you see. They're spiritual widows and orphans as well as physical. Um, We have to pay for our drinking water. Our wood comes to us at a price. Some think that this is not so much uh, buying the individual water, but a heavy taxation on the land. And that's probably m- more like what it is. When it says our pursuers are at our necks, remember the biblical uh, Near Eastern metaphor of putting your foot on someone's neck as a sign of victory or a sign of defeat? That's the metaphor here. And what it means is we would might say up to our neck in these guys. They were, you know, everywhere. 
They were all around, and that, that's the idea. We are worn out, and there is no rest for us. We have submitted. Now, the word submitted is to give your hand to. Uh, shaking hand began before baptism. I know that's hard to believe, but um, it did. And to shake someone's hand is a sign of submission in the, in the Orient. Uh, notice who, who they submitted to. Egypt and Assyria. Now, that sounds strange. Why would the nations of Egypt and Assyria be mentioned when Babylon is the world power and neither one of these have any, uh, any part in Israel or Judah's history now? Well, it goes back, I think, to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 18, where um, both Egypt and Assyria are somewhat under the control of Babylon now. Notice it mentions our fathers sinned and are no more, and it is we who have borne their iniquities. Now, I want to think with you. In Jeremiah 31, verses 18 and 19, uh, this is part of the excuses the people of Jeremiah's day give for not listening to Jeremiah. The very same thing happens in Ezekiel chapter 18. The people say, well, it's not our fault. God's just mad at us because our parents sinned and we're reaping the consequences of their sin. Now, there is an element of truth here that I want to show you and the element of falsehood, which is often the case in religious statements that are false. The true statement is that there is a sense of corporate responsibility for the family of God. What our parents sow we, to an extent, reap. And that's just the way it is. That's just pure sociology, culture, and the rest. In the book of, Levit excuse me, book of Exodus, chapter 20, Ten Commandments, verse 4 through 6, says that God will bless those who love him to the thousands generation, and God will curse those who curse him to the third and fourth generation. Now, I don't think God holds it against the children for the sins of the parents, but I do believe that parents transmit a lifestyle priority to their children. And those children do the same sins those parents do. And that cycle goes on. And I want to say to us that we are responsible for the society in which we live. Our society is way out of bounds in a lot of areas. We live in a godless, pleasure-oriented, materialistic society. But how often we close our eyes as Christians to what's happening all around us. And I want to tell you, we are going to reap and our children the society that we allow to develop in our own culture. Now, that's the true element. The false element is, what they were saying is, we haven't sinned. We're not guilty. Our parents were. They sinned. They are guilty. But we're innocent in God's punishment. Now, that's what <laughs> Ezekiel 18, Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19 are reacting against. It is true to say our fathers sinned. We also sinned, and we're bearing the consequences. Yes. But to say our fathers sinned, we haven't sinned, and we're bearing their consequences, no. No, every tub will sit on its own bottom. <laughs> it is possible for the children to change the lifestyle of the parents. Grace can make a difference. It is possible not to be dragged down the tube of heredity and environment. And so I think what the people are saying here is different from Jeremiah because over here in verse uh, 16, they're going to say, Woe to us! For we have sinned. That's exactly what the people would not say before the Babylonian invasion. They would not admit their own wickedness. They kept making excuses. Well, they've come to the place to admit it now. So I think this statement is somewhat true. Excuse me, it's uh, Jeremiah 31, 29 through 31 is the verses, not 18 and 19. Jeremiah 31, 29 through 31. That's also, as you remember, the chapter of the New Covenant. This discussion sets the stage for the New Covenant, and the New Covenant is basically an individual responsibility. Now, it says slaves rule over us, and there's no one to deliver us from their hand. Now, exactly who the slaves meant, we don't know. The people that were left in Jerusalem 
were the lower classes of society, the poorer people, and they took over all the land and all the houses that were left. Verse 9, we get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Now, what could that be? Well, there's two. We've got to look first of all. It says uh, the bread. So it's talking about their food crops. Now, what is the sword in the wilderness? Well, it seems to be these uh, periodic invasions of these marauding Bedouin tribes or maybe these excursions from Moab and Edom. And notice they came at the time of harvest. Of course they did. They came to get the food. There's nothing else to take in a desert. <laughs> and so I think that's what it is. Um, it says, Our skins have become as hot as an oven because of the burning heat of famine. Uh, some people are saying that, that your skin actually turns darker when you, in famine, but I've never been able to document that, and I'm afraid to admit that, so I don't know if that's true or not. Verse 11, they ravish the women in Zion, the virgins in the city of Judah. The sexual abuse that occurred to the vanquished cities is notorious and accurate. Princes are hung by their hands. Now, we don't know what this means. Commentators go two directions on this. In Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23, it says, Cursed is everybody who hangs on a tree. We often use that to refer to Jesus Christ being cursed by God because he was hung on a Roman cross. And that's probably the way the Jews of his day saw that verse. But in a day it was written, Jews are very shame-oriented, as all people of the Near East are. Saving face is very important to them. After a person was dead, the most humiliating thing you could do to that person and to his family was to strip him of most of his clothes and hang him or impale him in a tree or on a city gate or on a stake in public view. And so either it's referring here to the princes are killed and then hung up by their hands to dangle from the gate or trees or whatever was around there, or in modern uh, Arab society, this is a form of punishment. And the hands are tied behind you, and you are lifted up by your hands and meant to hang like that. It's usually a punishment for slaves and children. So do you see how the princes could be so humiliated as to have to experience the punishment of slaves and children, uh, that may be. It's either death or it's that. I don't know which, to tell you the truth, that it is. Now, in verse 13, it says, Young men working at the grinding mill. Grinding bread was considered a woman's work, Judges 16, 21. And young men would just not do it at all unless things have gotten this bad. But the Hebrew word, if you have a reference Bible, and look in the margin, it says... The young men carried the grinding meal. So maybe they just carried those big old stones around for the women to grind. We don't know. The Vulgate, which is, of course, the Latin translation, Jerome's translation of the Bible, picks up on the word grinding here, for it is used in a sexual sense in Job 31.10. And the, the Vulgate translates this, the young men are sexually abused. And maybe... That could fit the context. I'm just not sure which it is, but I think that's a little far-fetched. The youth stumble under loads of wood. Now, notice the word loads there. If you have New American stand, pardon me, Standard, is in italics. That always means it's not in the original language, but it's supplied for an English reader. What this is referring to is child labor, and not just minor child labor, but the loads that these young boys and girls are asked to carry is such they are falling down under the loads. You get the picture of what's happened now after the invasion and the overthrow? The elders are gone from the gate. Now, the rabbis, as they read this, and they know the temple has been destroyed and the city has been destroyed. They say, well, obviously this couldn't mean the gates because in Psalms 87.2, 
It says the gates will never be destroyed. So this must be the gates of the Torah or the law. Now you see how they're still reacting to this, rabbinically speaking. They just cannot believe God has allowed the temple to fall. And Zion, the place where he chose for his name to dwell, like even, even now rabbinical theology can't handle it. So they allegorize it. Now the gate, in our society, I don't know what this would be, unless you lived in a small town and there was a community house a place where families had their family reunions, a place where they had the monthly or weekly square dance, a place where they had the town hall meeting, a place where you went when there was anything about community-wide. You, you went there. If you went there for a wedding, you went there for a funeral, everything was done at that t- town hall kind of meeting place. That's what the gates were in the cities, ancient cities. There was not much room inside these walled cities. Space was very valuable, as you can imagine, because the population fled those cities in times of war or trouble. So there were wide spaces in only certain parts of the city, and this is called the gates. And what it was, it was a place where the judges gave judicial decisions. It was a place where the young men played their music. It was a social event there. They sung and danced there. It was a place of commerce, of buying and selling goods. All the social activities like weddings and things happened in these open spaces by the gates. So when it says the elders, who are the older leaders of the people, uh, are gone from the gates, it means all social activity has stopped. There's just none of that normal flow of life happening at all. Young men from their music. Uh, I was interpreting some psalms today for another Sunday school lesson, and I realized again, afresh and anew, how often the Bible speaks of music, especially the psalms the tambourine, the lyre, the psalter, the harp. I want to tell you, music is a natural part of the worship of man to God. Beautiful how often the Bible talks about it. Music is silent. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned into mourning. It's sad to me that Protestantism has so legalized the Bible that the joy the Jews feel at life is taken somewhat out. Remember, Phil, what a joyful time that Harvest Festival was. The whole community was there. The kids they had the parade, the dancing, the music. That atmosphere of festivity in the, in the abundance of God and the normal flow of life. It's a beautiful part of Israeli life even to this day and was then. Now it says, Woe to us, for we have sinned. There's the recognition of their problem. It says our crown has fallen. They thought they were somebody and found that they were nobody. Uh, Because of our heart is faint. The word heart there, of course, the symbol of the entire person. It means they're just so, they're so down because of things. Our eyes are dim. They can't believe it anymore. They can't see. They're so tired, disgusted. Because Mount Zion lies desolate. Mount Zion is a, a word that means all the city of Jerusalem, including the temple. As you know, the temple is not built on Mount Zion. The temple is built on Mount Moriah. Uh, but there are several hills in Jerusalem. And the Mount Zion is what the name came from. The word fox is proud on it. We're learning more and more. It seems unusual to have an animal like this, or ostriches, or jackals, however you want to make this word foxes mean. But we're finding more and more that these animal names are really the names of some of the deities of these Canaanite god, gods and goddesses, demons of the wilderness kind of thing. The more we, in, we find these cuneiform tablets of cognate Semitic languages like Ugaritic and all, the more these names of animals are coming to be certain kind of deities that haunt desolate places. And that's the idea here. If it's not that idea of deities, it's the idea that everything is so bad that even the wild animals haunt there because there's no human beings at all in the city. And then verse 19 and following is a close where it says, Thou, O Lord, dost rule forever. The word rule is the word sit. And the word throne, the second paragraph, gets the idea. Thy throne is from generation to generation. If I were to put this in a New Testament context, it would be Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What it's saying is God is consistent. God is in control. God is on his throne. History is in his hand. What has happened, God has done it. And he is just and consistent 
it is our fault, not God's fault. His judgments are true. That would be a, a way to put it. Why dost thou forget us forever? He's going back to that first word of this whole thing, remember. Why dost thou forsake us so long, or length of days? And then verse 21 and 22. Have you ever heard, been in a modern synagogue service, to hear a uh, professional cantor read the Scriptures? The Hebrew text is marked like a musical score. And there are set patterns or rhymes uh, that, that people go to school to learn how to read. Have you ever seen somebody at the Wailing Wall on television hold their book and the, they'll go like that? They're reading the Scripture to a beat. Well, in modern Judaism, verses 21 and 22 are reversed. Now, read them and see if you think can find out why you think the cantors would reverse 21 and 22. They read 22 first. Let me let you read that and you tell me why you think that. Why do you think? They want the book to close on a positive note, not a negative note. And so they switch them around. The deal about restore, restore us to thee, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. I want to tell you, the rabbis <clears throat> say, and I agree with them to some extent, that God even gives repentance as a gift. That man just doesn't one day decide, ah, I think I'll repent and turn to God. No, God always takes the initiative, even in repentance. And a couple of places for that are Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19, and Psalms 85, 4 through 7. It's the idea that God not only comes to us in grace, but God provides man the faith to respond with. You say, that's awful uh, predestination. Yeah, I know it is. But it just the way the Bible talks about the loving, initiating grace of God that comes to man not because of who man is, but because of who God is. I like that emphasis. I think it's true. Now, the last little part, in the midst of this petition that closes in, please, O Lord, help us come back to you, it closes on doubt, on pessimism. You say, oh, boy, this guy just didn't have any faith. I've tried so hard to convey to you, and I'm not sure I've been able to do it. Their whole theological world has been shattered. God promised never to let Jerusalem fall, and Jerusalem has failed. God has promised never to lack a, a divinic king on the throne, and the divinic king is gone, blinded in chains to Babylon. They're not sure if they can trust God or not. Some of the things he said would never happen, happened. And they don't know what to do about it. And so after they've said all they can say about God's in control and God pull us back, the last thing this man says as he looks over the burning ruins of the theological and religious center of Judaism is, unless thou hast utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. Do you catch the heart of the man looking over the burnt-out, charred ruins of the temple? The children are dying of starvation in the streets. The men are all dead from war. The women are being abused. There is nothing left of what there was. Do you hear him saying, I'm not sure if God still does love us anyway. And I'm not sure he's so mad he'll ever come back to us. But God, if there's any way... Will you remember? Will you think about us? Will you look how bad it's been? And he leaves it right there, in doubt, in faith, in the hands of God who is in control of history. I hope that you never come to the place in your life where you understand completely the book of Lamentations or the book of the Revelation. I pray to God you never go through that kind of time where those books are extremely meaningful to you. It's best not to know some things.
Questions or comments about the book of Lamentations? Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Yes, a little park almost in the smaller towns, isn't it? Kind of a. Yes. That's still called the town square. That's even in towns that aren't county seat towns, too, isn't it? The county seat towns, the county seat used to be in the middle, but in smaller towns it's just kind of like a park or something. Uh, community center. Yeah, that's exactly what that was to Israel. Right. So all social events. I really think this young men's music and the joy and dancing really are probably part of the marriage ceremonies. I, I don't think even today you realize what a when dig the Jews put on for a wedding. They don't last 30 minutes, everybody kiss and go home. They last for a week. <laughs> there is dancing. and he, Can you imagine one of our couples having to wait a week before the honeymoon? <laughs> they just have a tremendous... Weddings are just super important to Jewish culture, as families are. And they have long periods of rejoicing and feasting and lavish stuff. And I think that's what that joy and dancing and music making is, is a reference to that. May we pray. Lord, we have sinned also, and our fathers have sinned. And we do not know why that the hand of judgment has not fallen on our society. But Lord, we thank you that we've lived in a day when we can worship you freely and openly and honestly by the dictates of our own heart, and God, we do pray for our society. We pray for her. Help us to be the salt that you want us to be to permeate our town, our state, and our country. Lord, we ask forgiveness for the corporate sins of the people. And we pray you'd put a burden on our heart to do something about it. Lord, we know that Judgment is a horrible thing. And yet really this judgment was an act of your love that would not let your children go any further away lest they be lost completely. God, we thank you for the judgment that falls in our lives, the temporal hand that says no further, child. Help us to recognize that all things are in your hands, that no one can pluck us out of that love and yet, our lives are made more Christ-like by suffering and pain. Lord, I can't imagine what this author must have thought as he looked over the broken and burned ruins of his life materialistically, religiously. I've never had to do that, Lord, so I do not understand completely. But I thank you that in times of stress, you give us grace to cope. And I pray, Lord, that we would always have the dignity to learn the lessons from life you would have us to learn, to become more Christ-like in every confrontation and experience, and to trust you, Lord, no matter what the circumstances. Thank you for those who have been faithful to this study. I pray for them, Lord, as their Bible knowledge increases, that their love might increase that they would just not know more, but they would do more. I pray for each of us in our attitudes toward life and toward things and toward you that we might be pleasing to you. We love you, Lord, so much. Thank you for the bounty of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.